that is through the microsoft teams yeah uh, i think you can start with the uh, introduction onwards right. uh, as participants come they can catch up with where you left like. yeah all right so uh, again very sorry for the uh, technical difficulties and it was something was totally out of our control so hopefully there are no more uh, you know difficulties and i can i will try to finish this as soon as possible and if there's something which uh, is uh, which i'm not clear with or if i'm not audible or if i'm not making sense please shoot me a message and i'll try to answer each and every question either after this uh, presentation and you know jay shankar sir can actually send it across to all the participants who ask questions or i'll try to answer it if we have enough time in the end so uh, for today's talk i would i was i you know uh, I will be presenting a short primer on understanding the ecology and evolution of moths. And uh, before we got cut off, we, I, you know, uh, I spoke about a few things. I only spoke about what moths are and why. Yeah. Everyone has mute their audio. Yeah. Yeah. I think someone still has their audio on. Anushree, please mute yourself. All right. So yeah, uh, I just touched upon a bit of what moths are and why moths make a very interesting st study system and how moths have diversified and you know evolved over uh, time. So to give a very brief introduction, I'm not going to explain in detail. Moths belong to the order Lepidoptera, which means scaled-winged insects. There are 180,000 species of moths. Like many of them are undescribed, and we do not know anything except you know their name for at least for almost like 90% of the moths. It's very, very understudied, very, you know, poorly known uh, a group of insects, but whatever is, you know, known from a few of those, you know, in, uh, moths, we know a lot more about them. For example, the silk moth and yucca moths and flutella moths. And there are 120 families and this uh, keeps changing depending upon what, uh, you know, types of classifications the taxonomists are following. And these are holometabolous insects. That means they undergo a complete metamorphosis, uh, whereas you know grasshoppers and other things are not holometabolous because they just increase in size whenever they are, you know, after right after hatching out of their eggs. Whereas moths, uh, you know, have a you know uh, larval insta larval stages, five larval stages, then they have a, a cocoon stage and then they emerge out as adults. That's why it is known as holometabolous. And females are heterochromatic in moths. That means females have X and Y chromosomes. Whereas in humans, it's males who have X and Y chromosomes. And most moths are usually nocturnal, but many of them are diurnal or even crepuscular. And I'll talk about these, you know, in detail in the uh, in the coming slides. And moths have been used to study pheromone diversity in biology because each moth has its own pheromone uh, signature. And if you have at least two lakh species or around two lakh species, you have such a tremendous diversity of pheromones. And because moths, can you know either be diurnal or nocturnal or crepuscular you need to have fine tuning of vision to be able to see in those environments so therefore moths actually serve as a very very uh, great system to study how vision has evolved what kind of structures are there in you know uh, the vision and how natural selection say, uh, shapes uh, the diversity that we see in vi visual genes and hawk moths specifically have been used tremendously in you know uh, in flight dynamic studies to look at how uh, you know, moths fly and how do they turn and how, you know, what kind of uh, systems they have uh, to enable fast flight and enable efficient flight and even their body, you know, uh, morphology to aid their flights. And, uh, and co-evolution is something that has been extensively studied in moths. And I'll talk about this, uh, uh, you know, a bit more in the uh, uh, later on in the presentation. And a really interesting thing about, you know, a particular species of moth known as Galeria melonella. It's it's one of the few moths which have been used to study uh, toxicology uh, the effects of toxic compounds on humans because this moth has uh, the immune system similar to a human being. A lot of uh, you know research has been done where they test a lot of compounds on the on this moth, see what the reaction is and how well it is tolerated and what the effects are on its body, and that has been translated into human medicine or any sort of toxolo toxicology studies. And Helicoverpa armigera is one of the many pests that you know are present in moths, and these are devastating uh, pests which cause up to 40 or 30 billion dollars of, you know, uh, loss to agricultural crops every year. 
So this was the uh, basic, you know, background as to why Monster are such good uh, model systems. And then I spoke about uh, the first uh, fossilized, uh, I mean, the earliest fossil that we have of a moth is known as Archaeolopsis main, and this is very closely related to caddis flies. The body form is not, uh, you know, similar to the present day moths, but the, you know, it's kind of resembles, it kind of resembles the present day moths, and also it has a wing venation, you know, similar to present day moths. And moths kind of origin, you know, originated 300 million years ago. And I was specifically talking about what are some of the features that, you know, promoted diversification in moths. And the first one is when you know uh, land plants evolved. That is that was one really important event which promoted the diversification of moths. And the second one was the evolution of proboscis, which gave them a special niche to feed on in terms of nectar. So they were able to diversify further. And the evolution of uh, specific female mating and egg laying organs ensured that they even uh, that you know they could diversify even more. And uh, one really interesting thing, if you when you look at the phylogeny, is that butterflies and macro moths evolved around the same around the same time. And that was because you know it was right around like 60, 65 million years ago is when the earth kind of started warming up a bit more, and you could have high, you know larger body forms to actually uh, evolve and you know sustain on earth. So you know, uh, so most of the large-bodied animals are closer to the tropics, whereas you, if you see, you know, uh, in, especially in insects, and if you see, uh, you know, you kind of see smaller-bodied insects as you go away from the equator. But if you look at it in in terms of uh, large mammals, it's the opposite. It's called as the Berg's law. So you can read about it when you have time. And uh, one, you know, one interesting thing that I forgot to mention is that this is the best phylogeny we have so far on moths and this is only up to the uh, super family level i mean it, we do not have a you know very good phylogeny when it comes to species level i mean forget about species level i don't even think we'll have a good phylogeny of species level in the next 10 years it is just so tremendous in diversity sequencing them is a huge uh, task for any scientist with you know uh, who's studying moths and then this is where I stop. So I'm going to continue at my regular uh, speed from here. So uh, if you look at, you know, if you have observed moths for a long time, you will be thinking, okay, fine. Why are there so many geometric moths and why are there very few zygonid moths? So what is that, you know, which makes one particular groups of moths more diverse compared to the other particular clade of, you know, moths? And each group is known as a clade in biology, you know, in phylogeny. So you can talk about, you know, zygonid moths as a clade. You can talk about saturnid moths as a clade. You can talk about eribidae er moths as a clade. So each group is known as a clade. And this thought is actually not new. So the diagram here is from Darwin's book, uh, which is, you know, Origin of Species. Even when can, yeah, people mute their uh, screen, please. I mean, their audio. Yeah. So when Darwin first started thinking about species or how species were related he knew that uh, he knew that a lot of species uh, you know there were some groups which had many species and some some groups which had very less species so he started thinking about what could be causing that and that is something we are still studying right now i know looking at what makes a particular group of species diversify more and one of the best examples we have of what makes you know what makes some groups diversify more and some groups uh, less species rich is uh, by studying silk moth phylogeny. This was this came out uh, last year and there's a really, really good phylogeny which, you know, uh, provided a lot of information as to, I mean, this has been studied in a lot of other organisms as well, but this phylogeny is uh, specifically to moths kind of gave us an idea as to why some moth species or moth families are very diverse or what can be causing it. So to understand that, we need to understand three uh, terminologies. The first one is speciation rate. So that is basically uh, the rate at which new species form from existing species. And then the second one is diversification rate. And that is uh, the difference between speciation rate and extinction rate. Extinction rate is when, you know, the rate at which animals die and species animals or plants or, you know, any other organism dies. And speciation rate is when, you know, new things are born. So diversification rate is where you subtract speciation rate 
from extinction rate and then you see what the effect is so when you do i mean you can do that using molecular uh, evolution tools and you can plot that on a phylogeny and this is what they have done here so when they did that specifically for uh, the bombycoidae of uh, uh, super family they found that you know each uh, there were some groups which had very low diversification rate so if you see the legend here so 9.1 and 19 so the redder it is that means the fast you know it has more diversification rate that means it is accumulating more species compared to the number of species lost and the bluer ones is where it's accumulating lesser amount of species as you know species go extinct so spingidae and saturnidae have very high diversification rates that means they are you know most you have more species than extinctions whereas you know if you look at brahmidae or uh, other you know uh, bombycidae uh, uh, moths you have lesser species compared to what extinctions are and what does this depend upon so this actually depends upon three different you know uh, things so the first one is environmental conditions so if you have a very uniform kind of an environment let's say if the entire world was a grassland you would not have very diverse species because all of them would be competing for the same sort of resources so you would have a lot of competition and you would have a lot of extinction whereas if you have very varied uh, environmental conditions like you know we have in india the western ghats is completely different compared to what we have in the deccan plateau compared to what we have in the uh, you know uh, the plains of north india compared to what we have in the northeast and compared to what we have in the himalayas so different kind of environments give rise to different kinds of adaptations so therefore you know so whenever a particular uh, can common nuclear that Or can someone mute their audio, please? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, so where was I? Yeah. So, uh, so what happens is that let's say a moth, uh, which is found in the grassland, can start is starting to adapt to you know evergreen forests. That means you know when it goes into the evergreen forest, there are not many moths which is which it is competing with. So it is kind of released from competition and it can start to you know specialize and diversify. So that's one of the reasons why you have diversification rates higher in some groups and you know lower in another groups and so if you see you know for example geometridae moths you could say that okay fine you know are they found in various different types of environments if they are that means okay fine if they are found in so many different environments you can expect them to be more diverse compared to let's say an organism which is very very restricted to in one small you know hillock in the middle of nowhere and the second thing which influences is the age of the branch so for example if you see this phylogeny here whatever horizontal line you see is a branch and you see some branches are short some branches are long so longer branches mean they evolved a lot earlier in you know in time that means they have been there for a longer time so when you have a you know a older branch you have more chances of accumulating species over a period of time just as a fact of that you you know older branches usually have higher species richness in them and the third and the most important thing which kind of also you know uh, darwin noticed or probably the only thing which or one of the main things that darwin noticed is population size so when you have larger population sizes you know whatever kind whatever mutation or whatever effect you have on the population is kind of uh, you know nullified because it just gets lost in the population but when you have very small populations whatever smaller you know mutations whatever smaller adaptation you do see kind of gets expressed and passed on to the next generations much you know more compared to when the population is larger so when you have smaller population sizes of a lot of individuals then you know you kind of start diversifying a lot more compared to a larger population so if you can you know whenever you do go out you know think about it in terms of you know if i which if i'm seeing a brahmida moth you know if i'm seeing brahmia how many individuals you know are there is it a larger population is it a smaller population and then start looking at you know th start thinking about these things this will actually help you understand as to how species assemblages have evolved on earth so uh, these are i mean uh, these are the three things which actually influence diversification rate so now that we know you know we have so many moths we have so many you know you know diverse families of moths and this is how they diversify and this is how they specialize and all that let's go into actually learning about the life history traits of moths so this is something i'm pretty sure everyone is familiar with but i'll just you know run through it very briefly 
So the life cycle of a moth starts with the female laying eggs. I mean, usually when you have an egg, it hatches directly or it can go into a diapause if the uh, conditions are unfavorable. And then when the conditions are favorable, the egg hatches. And you have five, uh, you know, different instars in Lepidoptera. I mean, that's, uh, that's like a standard. You have five different instars. And once five, these five different instars are done, the uh, moth caterpillar, you know, spins a cocoon. And then it, you know, encapsulates, you know, in, in the cocoon. And then it flies out of, as an adult. So this is the life cycle. And each of these life cycles have been, you know, each of this life stage has its own uh, threats to, you know, existence, own adaptation to survive and own behavior. So I'll try to highlight a few of these uh, in the next few sites. And please remember, whatever I do so is just a tiny portion of what is actually there out in nature. It's just tremendous. And we can talk for years about, you know, what the life history evolution of moths are. So I'm giving you a very small opening window to it. And if you are interested, I really, I can recommend, you know, a lot of resources that you could use to understand these better. So the first thing that comes to anyone's mind, you know, how does a female know what plant to lay eggs on? And or how does a female search a plant? What, what, you know, I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure all of us started out thinking, you know, on these terms when we started learning or observing moths. So to go uh, to actually explain the mechanical basis of this, I uh, I'm going to go through a very short uh, pathway. So the first is, you know, let's say a female lands on a host plant using olfactory and visual cues, and I'll talk about these cues in, you know, in the in the next slide, but. Imagine, okay, fine, a female sees a host plant and she identifies it using olfactory, that means smelling, and visual, that means seeing. So she sees a plant and she smells it and she says, okay, fine, this is what smells like this, you know, smells like food to me, smells like food for my caterpillar. So she goes and lands on the plant, but that is just the first step of what happens in oviposition. And then what happens is that if you have observed uh, what females do closely is that whenever they go onto the plant, or any surface that they think is fine, they start scratching with their four legs. Yeah. So when they scratch with their four legs, uh, you know, the plant breaks open and, you know, it releases a lot of chemicals from the plant. And those are known as oviposition stimulants for the, uh, you know, which oviposition stimulants basically which in induce egg laying in moths. And these oviposition stimulants uh, receptors, that means the things which can, you know, identify this oviposition stimulants are actually in the legs of all these moths, in the four legs, the first two legs. Basically, what the moth is doing is basically it's tasting with its leg. So it goes there, you know, it scratches, it tastes and says, okay, fine. Does this, does this taste like my host plant? And there are specific receptors known as gustatory receptors. Gustatory receptors are those which give you the sense of taste. So in your mouth, if you have very less bitter gustatory receptors, you will not taste bitter. You might be able to eat bitter substances without a problem. So, uh, you know, the evolution of gustatory receptors is something which is very, very interesting and that can, you know, itself be talked about for, a, for days together. And there's also something that I'm working on in my PhD, but I'm not going to go in detail about the evolution of gustatory receptors. So, you know, the uh, receptors are specific to each stimulant. For example, let's say if a female goes and lands on a plant, she needs to find, she needs to be able to taste compound A, compound B, and compound C in the right concentration. If she does not get that taste, she will say, okay, this plant is not suitable for me. I'm going to find another plant. And if only A or B is present, she will still not identify it. And that is why, you know, these gustatory receptors are very, very specific to, you know, each and every, you know, host plant or host plant range that the females can accept. And then what happens is that this, uh, you know, information is processed into in the central nervous system, and that signal kind of, you know, uh, elicits, you know, egg laying in females. So it goes on to, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, briefly, you know, uh, just run through it. Female lands on the host plant, scratches the host plant, tastes the host plant, and it, the taste has to be very specific to what is acceptable to the female. And then that information is relayed directly, you know, in, you know, into the central nervous system, and then you have uh, you know, egg laying, in, uh, egg laying occurring. And there are a lot of factors that affect uh, host plant choice. The first one is temperature. So when you have lower temperature, first of all, the moths are not active in general. And even when they're active, they're, you know, they're 
uh, the processing uh, capacity or the you know the transmission between central nervous system and the gustatory receptors are low so you kind of have lesser you know uh, specificity to host plants so the females will not be able to uh, what do you call uh, identify the host plants very well so when you have the optimum temperature or a, or at a higher temperature females are able to identify the correct host plants and host plant quality in general let's say you know uh, a pus you know uh, let's say a slug moth lays you know its eggs on castor plant so for it to actually lay egg on castor plant the castor plant should actually have the desired you know quantity of uh, ricinin in it the desired quantity of other nutrients in it and all of this you know is uh, you know is assessed or it is kind of made a decision when the female lays i mean starts scratching the leaf so it can assess host plant quality it can also assess plant chemistry and you know then it can make a choice as to if i should lay eggs here or not so host plant quality is something which can be affected by temperature it can be affected by what kind of soil the plant has been growing and what kind of you know other stresses the plant has you know experienced previously so host plant quality itself is a huge field and the third thing is plant chemistry each butterfly or sorry each moth species has its own set of plants that it can lay eggs on and that is directly tied to what kind of gustatory receptors each of the moth species has and you know the gustatory receptor evolution and host plant specificity is tied together so you need to have the right plant you know right kind of plant chemistry for example if a slug moth needs to lay egg on castor plant it needs to you know be able to uh, detect ricin in uh, uh, ricin in the plant and also if uh, of when a female tries to go lay eggs on uh, the plant if there are larvae which are already present on the plant the larvae actually start secreting chemicals through their feces their you know their poop and that can actually prevent additional females to lay eggs and that's kind of a strategy to prevent competition on a single plant so if there are larvae already present on the plant it's very unlikely that the female might lay eggs and if she has no other choice then she'll lay eggs but if she has other choice she'll kind of just move on to another plant and the degree of specialization that what i spoke about in terms of very narrow set of host plants for moths and one really interesting thing about moths is that this is very very fascinating with moths that the gustatory receptors are very diverse in moths so each moth you know some moths have like 30 or 40 different types of receptors that means they can you know if you do permutation and combination they can actually identify that many plants you know that many kinds of plants <coughs> sorry so that's why you have absolute generalists in moths i mean you in terms of host plant um, ability to feed on host plants or lay eggs on host plants moths are you know can be absolute generalists where they lay eggs on like hundreds of plants or they can be absolute specialists where they can just lay eggs on one plant so all the pests that we see they have very diverse gustatory receptors therefore they are very generalized and they can feed on a lot of things and once the you know female lays the eggs what are some things which affect how well up you know larvae develops so the first thing is physical differences so for example a b c d and e are different types of physical differences that the plant actually has to prevent you know caterpillars from eating the plants so a is thorns b is you know modified leaves in uh, cactus uh, c is modified stem in rose d are d is you know the hairy substances that you see in a lot of plants and fruits and e is very tough leaves so all of these modifications kind of makes it hard for the caterpillars to feed on these plants and you also have a lot of plants which deposit calcium oxalate crystals so that will kind of you know either make it really hard for the caterpillar to eat or just poison the caterpillar so those are you know some of the physical differences that the plants have you know that will make make it harder for the caterpillars to feed on and you also have a chemical difference which is something which a lot of chemical ecologists study a lot of plant insect interaction biologists study so i'll try to explain this in a minute i mean uh, within a minute so uh, let's say you know uh, you see a moth caterpillar any sort of moth caterpillar munching on a plant so what happens is that the plant has direct defenses where it kind of sends in all its chemical compounds to the leaf makes it harder for the plant you know caterpillar to eat but the caterpillar has specific gustatory receptors which it can actually overcome these uh, direct defenses and it kind of eats it very well and then what that what the plant does is it kind of attracts predators using chemical signals and you have ants you have parasitoids coming in and they will start attacking the caterpillars and that is a kind of indirect defense but you know and 
what do caterpillars do in you know when that happens is basically they have various adaptations for example slug moth caterpillars have spines on them a lot of you know most of the moth caterpillars build uh, you know they roll the leaves and you know hide themselves so all of these kind of prevent uh parasitization or predation you still see a lot of parasitization and predation but if these caterpillars did not have these defenses they would you know we all the moths would have gone extinct so this is an overview of how plant defense and caterpillar you know uh, counter defense occur and how these two things can actually keep evolving over a period of time so each of them keep updating you know upgrading their uh, weapons and this is an you know never ending race and this is actually known as evolutionary arms race so you can actually read about it in, in any sort of uh, ecology, ec ecological literature prey predator interactions herbivore patho you know uh, plant interactions and pathogen and host interaction all of these are uh, uh, evolutionary arms race where you know both of these things want to stay alive and they keep upgrading their arsenal of weapons and they keep you know fighting out this battle all the time and uh, come you know when i told you guys about generalist was a specialist species of caterpillars this has a lot to do with what the host plant chemistry is so here are four you know caterpillars this is a study done in 2008 by roslin uh, and others so the first one is uh, i mean yeah the, one two three four is one two three and four I, I don't want to spend more time on the species names so what they did here was uh, you know two of these are uh, specialist moths which can feed on uh, uh, vescalagen two of these moths are generalist species which cannot feed on vescalagen so generalist that means they can you know feed on the plant but they are not very well specialized to feed on vescalagen so what they did was they put all of these four moths on you know uh, plants and they added i mean on substrates and added either tannins which are secondary compounds which are present in most plants so they wanted to see how it happens when you have a common denominator kind of a secondary compound and they added specific vescalagen which is you know specific to the plants that these specialized caterpillars have evolved on and these uh, and some of these generalist caterpillars can also feed on so what they found out was that the amount of leaf that was eaten was also very less between these two species which are generalist the amount of you know uh, body mass gain was also different when it was uh, when vescalagen was added for these generalist species so what this kind of tells us is that specialized species can actually feed better when there is secondary compounds when there is you know toxic compounds whereas generalist species which feed on a lot of plants can still feed on it but their quality of life will not be that great so for example if you think of helicover parmigiana which feeds on 400 different plants it can feed on you know toxic uh, tobacco plants but it's uh, you know in terms of its growth in terms of its weight in terms of its you know overall health condition it, it will not be as great as let's say a uh, tobacco moth right tobacco moth is specifically evolved to feed on tobacco it can do very well it can outcompete the it can outcompete helicoverpa and uh, that is how these evolutionary dynamics play into picture where you have specialist species which are exploiting or uh, these plant resources very well and you have these generalist moth species which are able to exploit a lot more plants but not as effectively and both these strategies have pluses and minuses depending upon you know what context you're talking about so now that we know you know how moths lay eggs how moths locate mates let's you know so how moth lay eggs and how you know moth caterpillars feed let's talk about how do actually moths locate their you know con specific mates and the most important and the most specific things i mean most interesting thing about moths is pheromones so you have these two moths here you can see this moth has its you know uh, uh, all its secondary sexual characters you know averted out and it's you know when it does this it is sending out a lot of specific chemicals out in the environment for the females to uh, sense and also the females do the same thing moths are one of the few groups of animals where both males and females have specific pheromones then this is something which is not seen in butterflies where males have most of the pheromones whereas in moths a lot of males and females also have it and this is another you know yeah modified structure where you know it is sending out chemical signals so what are the qualities of pheromones they are very highly species specific so this is uh, this happens because they do not want to mate 
with species which are not their own. So it, it kind of prevents hybridization because whenever you have hybrids forming in nature, they're usually sterile and you kind of, there's no point of, you know, I mean, you really cannot reproduce after the first generation. So hybrids are usually not favorable and therefore these pheromones are very highly species specific. And they uh, another characteristic is that they have very long range communication. I mean, you put out a specific type of pheromone out in the field, you can attract moths in no time. I mean, it, it, it can get moths from kilometers away because these uh, chemicals are uh, volatile, but they do not dissipate. So you have these whole, you know, molecules of these uh, pheromones traveling for very long distance. And that is something chemical ecologists have been studying for a long time, and they're very, very interesting results from it. And these pheromones are also under intense natural and sexual selection because the females can only mate with those males which have very high quality and very strong signal. So over a period of time, you only have, you know, moths which have very high quality pheromones and very high, you know, intense pheromones. So it is always under selection. It is always under intense selection. So you have, the, you know, that's why you have specialization of very specific compounds. And that's why you see such a huge diversity. And like I said, it, moths are very, in one of the very few groups where you have both the sexes having a pheromone uh, uh, present in, you know, both the sexes. And this is something which is very, very interesting. So there is actually a database known as the ferrobase, where people have been depositing all the pheromones that they have found out, all the pheromone uh, in the chemical structure, the NMR structure, you know, everything that is known about the pheromone. And they have more than... I think, you know, 30,000 entries and, you know, it's it's crazy. It's, you know, if you really want to study pheromones, if you want to study how pheromones are related, if you want to, you know, you can use these pheromones to actually plot on a phylogenetic tree to see how pheromones have actually evolved in nature. You can use this database. You can go there. You can, you know, download whatever uh, pheromones you're interested in, whatever moth species you're interested in, and then look at it. So this is ferrobase.com. If you have time, if you're really interested in looking at pheromone evolution, this is something I definitely recommend you guys to check out. So that is the basic life history of uh, moths. And now the next thing is, what do moths do? What is, you know, what kind of behavior do moths have? And what is the importance of having moths in nature? And one of the most, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the two most important uh, ecosystem services that moths provide are one is they are, you know, prey, they are prey for a lot of predators and two, they are pollinators. And, you know, people might, you know, a lot of people thought moths might not be efficient pollinators because whenever they studied, they usually studied bees and bees have way more pollination capacity compared to moths. Totally, you know, you know, agreeable. We, I mean, I do agree with that point. But one thing where moths outshine any other organism is nocturnal pollination because none of the other insects are active during the night. Very few insects are actually active during the night, especially proboscis. Uh, Insect, you know, insects with proboscis and moths are actually probably the only ones which are active at night. So a lot of flowers, a lot of plants are have evolved in tandem with moths to be able to specifically give out signals to be pollinated in the night. So, for example, let's say if you see any night blooming flower, you know that A, it is usually white in color and B, it is very, very fragrant i can say fragrant or it can be it, it is very it has a very strong odor it can be pleasant odor it can be like a corpse it can be like feces it can be anything so a lot of you know night blooming plants have specific uh, adaptations which actually have evolved to help moths locate them easier and you know help them pollinate better and why you know you can ask me the question as to why did plants evolve to become you know pollinate in the night because in the morning there's so many in, you know during the daytime there's so many plants which are which bloom and there's so many insects competing for nectar resources so a lot of plants might actually not get pollinated and you know they might not reproduce so shifting to uh, nocturnal uh, pollination was beneficial for plants as well as hawk moths you know as well as moths because the moths didn't have to compete with other insects in the morning so that's a background about why moths and you know are important nocturnal pollinators. So when Darwin, you know, uh, when Darwin actually went to you know Madagascar, or, you know, when he got uh, specimens from Madagascar, so he saw this plant here. It's an orchid known as the star orchid. He was very surprised with the flower. The flower is you know probably four or five you know centimeters in length, 
but it had a 30 centimeter or something long uh, Corolla tube. The minute he saw it, he said, I wonder what kind of a moth could be pollinating it. He knew it was a moth pollinating it because this bloomed in the night and this had very fragrant smells. But Darwin never saw the moth. Darwin didn't even know that if a moth like that ever existed or was it just him hypothesizing, saying that, you know, there could be a moth actually pollinating it. But after 150 years or 160 years, scientists actually found the moth in Madagascar. And when they found it, they were, you know, they were not surprised because the moth had a 30 centimeter long proboscis. And this is known as the Darwin's moth. So, you know, this flower can only be pollinated by the Darwin's moth because, you know, to reach the pollen, it has to go all the way to the end of the tube and no other moth can, you know, enter that distance except this moth. So a lot of these moths and, you know, flowers have covalved so tightly that without the moth, the plant cannot survive and without the plant, the moth cannot survive. So this has a lot of implications and habitat, you know, destruction, because if you're destroying even a part of a small habitat where this plant could be available, it has a very strong implications on what it could do to the population of these Darwin moths. And this is something that we should always probably worry about because in India, we have so much destruction of habitats going on. And people might say it might be a grassland which is getting destroyed. It might be a wasteland which is getting destroyed, but each and every, you know, Habitat has its own set of locally adapted, co locally adapted and co-evolved interactions, and destroying one also destroys the interaction. So it is very important to you know keep in mind or you know start thinking about these issues. So this is, I mean, there is not a better example of textbook level, you know, uh, example of coevolution apart, you know, when you compare the Darwin's moth and the star orchid. This is literally the best example one can give, and that comes from a moth. And another thing which has been studied extensively for the past 50 years is the yucca and the uh, yucca plant and the yucca moth. So yucca is a uh, type of desert plant which is found all over uh, the north, all over North America. And what happens here is that this moth is an obligate, uh, you know, mutualist with the flower. So when I say obligate, that means it has no other choice but to just do, uh, just depend on the flower. So what it does is, you know, the female, I mean, the moths usually pupate in the ground and once they emerge out of the ground, they mate on the plant. The males, you know, arrive on the plant, the females are on, uh, arrive on the plant and they mate on the plant, especially on the flower. And once mating is done, the female goes into the flower, collects the pollen and then flies out to another flower. And then, you know, when she goes out to another flower, she goes into the developing ovules and then lays her eggs on the ovules. And the larvae actually, you know, uh, start eating the seeds. But in the process, she has also pollinated the other flower. So without, you know, the yucca moth, the yucca plant will not survive. And without the yucca plant, the yucca moth will not survive. It's literally the most specialized uh, co-evolved uh, interaction there is in terms of pollination. And people have been studying this for 50 years. They have, I mean, this studying this moth has given us insights on coevolutionary processes. It has given us insights on local adaptation. It has helped us understand how is that, you know, such a specialized interaction can evolve and what are the consequences of these interactions and what does this help us understand? You know, what, how will this help us understand the biology of moths in general? So it is a very, very interesting system to study uh, pollination. I mean, there is not a better system than moths to study pollination. And there is also other moths, for example, the Plutella moth, which feeds on another plant, which has another obligate mutualism uh, with it. So you can find tons and tons of examples. Even in India, we do not know of it yet. That is because we have not been looking at moths that, uh, you know, closely. So if, in terms of, I mean, if I have time, I'll, you know, I'll probably spend three or four minutes kind of discussing a few student projects that people can do just by staying in your backyard or just by, you know, visiting your local pass. So hopefully we will have five minutes at the end. I'm, I'm trying to, yeah, I'll try to rush in a bit more. And when you have, you know, pollination occurring between, you know, moths and plants, there's, you know, you, you kind of have co-evolution happening. So the moths evolve specific characters to be able to feed on those specific flowers and the flowers have, you know, specific adapt adaptations to help the moths feed better. So when you, and the way we study these interactions is through pollination networks. So here is three pollination networks. The first one is 
between moths on the left side, 103 species of moths with pollinating 47 species of plants. And this one is uh, hoverflies and uh, uh, butterflies on the left and the plants on the right. And this one is moth, this one, the uh, orange one is the uh, bees and wasps on the plants. But if you see here, moths have the highest diversity of pollination networks compared to any other species. Even if you, you know, group in butterflies and hoverflies, you still have 76 species in this landscape. Whereas when you just study moths, you have uh, over 100 species. What this is, is that mo moths are very, very co-evolved to, you know, in terms of pollination networks and how much they can pollinate. So it's, it, you know, diversity of moths is a very, very good indicator of plant diversity, a very good indicator of biodiversity in the region. You can have, you know, a lot more bees and uh, moths, you know, butterflies, but moths actually can indicate how good or how specialized or how diverse the landscape is. And we usually do this by, you know, doing field surveys and we analyze uh, pollen of proboscis. So what we do is we uh, collect moths and we uh, scrape the pollen off their proboscis using a small pen. You do not damage the moth and then you release the moth. And then you study the pollen under slides and you, you have guides which says what pollen belongs to what plant and you can actually construct these networks. And this is something which a lot of students can do back in India where, you know, all you have to do is just set up moth traps and using, you know, whatever required permissions and required skills, you, you know, you need to develop. Once you develop those, you can briefly handle the moth. You can use a pen, you know, spread the proboscis and then collect the pollen and then release the moth. And then, you know, use those pins and mount a slide using all of these pollen uh, grains. And then take the help of the amazing botany professors that we have all over India. And then, you know, identify all these pollen. And then you can build these networks and you can actually have a better understanding of what kind of system services do these moths provide. So that's uh, a brief, you know, overview of the behavior of uh, moths. And the last thing that I want, I mean, last but one thing that I want to touch up on is the anti-predator adaptation in moths. Because moths are herbivorous insects, they are preyed upon left, right, and center by a lot of organisms. So moths have very specific anti-predator adaptations which help them survive in this world. And the most well-known of that is uh, echolocating, I mean, so the most, uh, the probably the most uh, common predator of moths are bats because bats are active in the night and moths are also active in the night. So what happens is that, you know, moths, bats kind of eat moths all the time. So how do moths avoid bats? So we all know that bats use echolocation to uh, identify moths. So what moths have developed is that, you know, they use their hind wing tails. So if you see here, the tail here to jam the, uh, you know, echolocating signal that the bat is using and just escape from there. So uh, people did a bunch of experiments. They're still doing a bunch of experiments. Look at what was the effect of tails on, you know, survival. So this is the capture rate. That means how many percentage of times were the moths captured? So the moon moths, which had their tails intact, were captured at a very low rate, like around 30%. Whereas if you remove the tails of the, you know, the, the remove, if you remove the hind wing tail, of the moth, the moths were, you know, much more captured frequently. And they used another moth as a control. It almost had a 100% moth, I mean, 100% capture rate. Those moths did not have any chance of surviving the bat attack. And they also compared with an other uh, moth, which is not present in the area. And even that had uh, an intermediate level between intact and uh, uh, cut off uh, hand wing tails of this moon moth. So, these uh, tails actually help in jamming the signals because they start beating uh, rapidly when they uh, sense these uh, uh, echolocating signals from bats and they move away and they jam it. So bats really cannot locate. It's like basically blinding a bat and asking it to find you. So it has a very low chance of finding it when your tail is in intact and it will definitely catch you when you do not have a tail. And another thing with uh, moths is that a lot of moths are aposematic. Aposematic is where you are toxic and you also exhibit it. So poisonous uh, uh, organisms or toxic organisms usually have very, very bright coloration so that predators kind of remember it and do not attack it at all. So there are a lot of moths, for example, the zygonid moths and a lot of tiger moths, which are aposematic, which are very toxic, which are also very, very colorful, which have very bright colors and patterns. So if you have to develop that amount of toxicity, if you have to be able to, you know, you know, 
have you know adaptations to develop such toxicity you need to lose something or you need to have a trade off because you cannot have the best of everything because it's very costly in nature so you know there is always a core you know what people have found out was that if you you know whenever you go out in nature if you see something which is flying very lazily or nonchalantly very lazily you can kind of get you know make an assumption that it is a toxic moth because you know for example let's say here uh, in this graph in the first part of the graph from right to left is you know how fast the flight was so this is very fast flight more gray means more fast flight less gray means it's very slow flight so the one here on the right is the slowest flying moth the one here is the fa fastest flying moth in the study that they did and what they found out was that the more black you see the more toxic they are so moths which were highly toxic had very 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 slow flight so that means they are showing their flight they are saying you know i'm lazy because i'm not lazy so that's a very bad way to put it my flight is lazy because i do not really need to invest any energy in flight because i have already invested all the energy that i need for protection in aposematism so that is the trade off you have when you have no aposem i mean when you do not have any toxic compounds to protect you you fly fast because you need to run either you run or you are you know you are toxic so that's the trade off that exists and this is very very well studied in moths and tiger moths and zygonid moths are absolute model systems to study these and another thing is that you know a bats have i mean so not bats moths have also evolved ultrasonic hearing so that means you know because bats use ultrasonic uh, waves to uh, detect moths these uh, moths have also evolved ears in you know uh, to detect them and uh, when people found out you know how much time do moths invest fly you know flying in the night they found that moths that had ears flew a lot longer compared to moths that did not have ears so there's also a trade off here moths that have evolved ears can actually spend more time flying and finding you know resources whereas moths that have no ears they can they have to be very quick in uh going about their you know life history otherwise they will get eaten up and this ultrasonic hearing is actually uh you know in a evolutionary arms race both in bats and moths because bats are developing i mean they are you know ev evolving mechanisms where they can actually locate moths better and uh moths have uh moths are evolving adaptations where they can hear even the slightest of ultrasonic sound that they can you know perceive so this is again under very constant selection and they keep evolving uh you know more and more over time and the uh, and the last thing is with caterpillars um you know if you have ever touched the stagma caterpillar i'm pretty sure you would be itching for a while and uh, when people um, and you know when people wanted to understand why do so many slug moths have you know spines in them and how did it evolve so what they did was they you know they used the phylogeny of the slug moths and they plotted uh, what you know character the slug moth had character is where you know you either have a spine or you do not have a spine for example here is the character state so red is where you have spines present and orange is where you have spines present initially and then you you lose it and white is where you have no spines at all and then you know you have other state which are not important so what what they found out was that the spines evolved very early on in you know in these moths that means the ancestor of all of these uh, slug moths had spines and that kind of tells us that these guys have uh, had uh, you know predatory pressures from way back in time and that's why they had to evolve it and majority of the slug moths still have it but there are few slug moths which have lost it completely they they are they do not have spines and they no longer sting and when they actually investigated as to why that you know has happened they found out that a these slug moth caterpillars were very small so having spines were was actually counterproductive because the spines would have to be bigger enough where the spines had to be big enough to be you know effective and if they had to be big enough then you know they would have lost a lot more adaptations that they had so smaller slug moths lost their spines and slug moths were you know which had lower predatory pressures over a period of time also lost their spines so these the, the white ones are actually in you know in uh, australia where you know predatory pressures in islands are different compared to mainland so combination of small size and uh, no predators kind of you know uh, you know they lost their spines because of that
and lastly i want to very briefly touch up on this and i'll try to finish it in the next one minute so evolution of vision in mods mods are the perfect system to study vision because they have such diverse uh, uh you know uh, habit i mean their you know uh, day activity they are active during the day they are active during the night they are active during a lot of times and to be able to see properly during those you need to have very specific uh visual pigments visual uh, genes and you know anything everything to do with vision you need to be very fine tuned so when people started looking at what happens you know when it what are you know uh, what how the evolution of these genes have occurred uh, they found this so the basic unit of uh, a visual gene is known as an opsin gene so opsin is the one which is which is expressed when some when light hits you know your receptor and this one is actually by an indian yash sondi who is a friend of mine and who is also a very active you know moderator and uh, member of um, mods of india so he has recently published this so he compared uh, uh, the you know the expression the gene expression of a lot of moths which are were nocturnal and diurnal so the first one is just comparing 14 moths and the second one is comparing how the opsin gene itself looks like and the third one is looking at how it looks like when you you know superimpose it on a, on the species itself so what he found out was that there is a lot of differences between the diversity of uh, opsin genes in diurnal moths versus nocturnal moths and how much of expression it has over you know what kind of a vision you have and that is really important for us because this is one of the few studies which says that there is differences in nocturnal vision and diurnal vision and therefore you have that separation and what uh, another group of people also found out was that when you you know uh, look at differences between male and female moth vision then you see a very significant pattern as well so for example females have higher uh, uh, you know red or when you i mean so on the x axis is the on the x axis is the number of days after you eclose and on the y axis is your expression levels so females have higher expression on day 1 you know when they first eclose because most of their mating occurs the minute they are out because it's very rare to find an unmated female in nature no matter how fresh she is it's a, there's a very high chance that she is mated so usually red is something that is used in mate location so they have very high levels of you know red options on day 1 and males you know have different kind of you know option patterns where they have more blue compared to the females and they also have higher uv because that kind of you know helps in mate uh, selection and the levels of these options also change depending upon if you were in the dark or not if you were in the dark if you were in the dark then you had a longer you know you had higher expression of red but your uv did not was not affected if you were in the dark or not so all of these you know puzzles and you know pieces of puzzles kind of help us understand how did you know vision evolve and what kind of factors you know uh, influence vision and how what do we learn from these and what does it tell us about the world so it's my moth serve as the best example for it so this is how opsin genes have evolved so this is where my you know talk ends and i'm really sorry for all the technical difficulties that happened and something that i definitely recommend all of you guys to do is to contribute your records to i naturalist and moths of india because these two websites are very very useful for everyone in terms of you know citizen scientists in terms of you know professional scientists in terms of everyone i mean i have used i naturalist so much and my phd would not have gone this smoothly without i naturalist because when i moved to the us i did not know anything about the plants here i did not know anything about where these plants were found or these butterflies were found and it was because of i naturalist that i was able to get all of these things much quicker than me finding it out by myself so try to you know update all your records and everything or upload your records here and in terms of studying moths i uh, i told you i mean some of the student projects that you can do is you know start looking at pollinator networks because that is something which is not at all studied in india it's very very less and we have such tremendous diversity of plant we have such tremendous diversity of moths and we can produce data and you know studies which no other country has ever produced and we do not need professional scientists to do this we need students we need citizen scientists we need people who are just interested who are out there you know doing field work who are out there observing moths i mean you do need you know professional scientists to help you analyze data but that's not a big deal but you need people who are interested to collect these information about you know studying pollinator moths and you know pollination networks or even observing life cycles because we do not know 
the life cycles of a lot of moths and that will actually tell us how specialized each assemblage is and how special you know generalized each uh, each assemblage of moths in the nature and i will be open to any sort of you know discussions that you want in terms of planning your study or if you want me if you want me to help you plan studies uh, i mean i i've passed my email to tressa and jay shankar sir you can contact me anytime and i'll be more than happy to help you all thank you nitin thanks a lot for sharing with us uh, a wonderful informative talk on moth ecology and evolution uh the session is now open for discussion uh dr john paul will take over he will moderate the session there are some questions here as well as on the youtube link so dr john paul over to you okay nitin that was uh, okay really, uh, please speak a little louder so nice i can hear you yeah yeah uh, can you hear me now yeah i can hear you sir thank you yeah yeah that was very very much informative it was really wonderful uh, actually after these many years uh, i i myself i'm uh, uh, listening to such a, a, a wonderful informative uh, talk okay that was very nice uh, dear participants uh, in case we have any doubts queries uh, in person you can ask uh, nitin now directly or some people have posted uh, uh, in your uh, in the youtube link as well as uh, you uh, raise your uh, questions uh, to the uh, uh, organizer uh, let me read it out uh, not an issue in case if you want to ask nitin directly you can uh, proceed sorry i have a power cut, cut power cut in my house so you may not be able to see me hi nitin harsha i have a small question yeah so hey uh, does memory of the host plant as larvae play a role in adult choice will a moth that ate plant x as a larvae be predisposed to be laying eggs on a plant x again so that's actually a very interesting question and that's something that i'm also working on in my phd but let me uh, I, 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 and i'm actually you know i'll be able to answer your question a little better now so uh, a lot of people thought that you know larval experience influences adult oviposition as well so there were a lot of papers which came out in the 80s and 90s which said you know that there is a memory of the larvae which feeds on a particular set of host plants that it's you know gustatory receptors evolved specifically to that and moths will actually you know moths will lay eggs on that when they are adults but that is not true in most of the cases because uh most of the moths have uh gustatory receptors which are not that fine tuned when they are when they are larvae so the gustatory receptors that are there in larvae is not correlated with the gustatory receptors that are there in the adults and you know you could i mean the only thing that you can be certain about what happens in larval stage is what kind of you know genetic background the female has in terms of uh being able to successfully you know what you call transmitted to the you know offspring and they would be able to eat it but there is not a lot of transmission from larvae to uh adults and uh, there was this one really interesting paper which is known as the the title goes like this it's called do you know the first time which is a very bad innuendo but yeah it's uh, it spoke about you know larval memory and uh, adult oviposition choice and they found zero evidence for it and it is uh, possible in a few uh, instances for example when you have host races and that is there in a lot of aphids a lot of grasshoppers where you have uh, you know over a period of time you have adaptation to a single host plant and you cannot just go away from it and that kind of evolves from you know a feedback between larvae and adults but in moths and butterflies you do not see this correlation there is a very diverse set of gustatory receptors and they are kind of not so tightly linked with between uh, larvae and adults did that answer your question yeah cool i had i had yeah. one quick question if I'm allowed to ask another. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, can you speculate why some certain species of very tiny moths, which are very weak flyers, are distributed very wild, widely geographically? Like they're found on multiple different continents. Say, for example, the family Crampidae. Yeah. So again, so I mean, there are two uh, ways where you can approach this. One is to look at when did Crampidae first evolve and where did they evolve. So, for example, you know. 
if crime day is a very old lineage of moths you would expect them to have diversified a lot more over a period of time and depending upon where they evolved if they had evolved let's say when it was still gondwana or it was just you know when all the continents were still split you know joined together you could expect them to be distributed all around that continent and when and even after the continents split up they could diversify in their own uh, uh, continents that's what happened to a lot of lizards where you know uh, i mean that's how that's how you have multiple diversification occurring in different continents so in terms of crambidae i mean having a small size is something i mean smaller size uh, actually uh, is, is shown to have positive speciation rates and that's because you know the energy invested in uh, small size has you know when you have smaller size you also have very faster life cycles right i mean that is kind of correlated so when you have faster life cycles when your body is small you have more generations per you know year or per season compared to any other bigger uh, moths so once you have that you can you know kind of expect more mutations to accumulate more adaptations to accumulate and that's why you could diversify more so these are speculations but again you know this is actually a very interesting thing that anyone in the audience could actually you know plan to study because all you need is look at uh, go to i naturalist or moths of india or any other website that has you know species of crambidae listed take it down and then you know go to the ncbi website and download all the sequences for those moths and build a phylogeny tree using software and then you can you know kind of see okay when did these guys come in and what kind of uh places have higher diversification rates you can actually test this but if you ask me i think yeah that's my answer that smaller size has faster evolution i mean faster life cycles and depending upon how old the branch was you could have more diverse you know diverse nature of crambidae moths nitin yeah this is shiv kumar here hello sir how are you ah uh, fine how are you good sir yeah <laughs> Yeah, today is one of the happiest day. Today I am asking you the doubt, and you have to teach me now. <laughs> okay, you are just uh, speaking about the uh, ovary deposition in moths on the yeah. plants, isn't it? Yeah. So, as you answered just now to Harsha's question, uh, do you think that the ovary deposition every time will be a trial and error method for the moth? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, it is. Uh, it is. I mean, I think all all ovary position. uh trials are trial and error and that actually has a benefit for the moth so uh moths which have very high specificity of uh, host plant choice when they have when they where they do not make any mistakes they do not evolve adaptations to feed on you know or lay eggs on other plants so a lo lot of generalist moths they lay eggs on anything they lay eggs on walls they lay eggs on bicycle racks they lay eggs on wherever they find and that's because they do a lot of trial and error so over a period of time you kind of evolve you know diverse uh, receptors to be able to uh, you know identify more plants so trial and error is actually a beneficial strategy if you are staying in the tropics but yeah. if you are in the temperate regions it's a very bad thing because you first of all have very small amount of plants you have probably like 3 months in a year where you can survive and if you make mistakes then there's a high chance that you will you know go extinct no that's a good idea but uh, trial and error method don't you think the moths will have to invest a lot of energy going in search of a uh, comfortable zone for ovary deposition then uh, so uh, so in terms of trial and error it it is not the female that has to you know actively invest too much energy it is the larvae which have to invest a lot more energy in searching the right host plant so for mm. example you know imagine a scenario where there is a host plant in the region but the female lays the eggs on some other plant mm -hmm. so the larvae will have to have enough energy or enough you know uh, capacity to actually uh, realize that they are on the wrong plant and then start moving on to the right plant and sometimes you know this is uh, possible when females have if, if for example let's say if a female was very healthy and if the male which mated with the female gave a lot of nutrients during mating the females have excess nutrients and this nutrient is translated into eggs so the eggs are you know fat rich they are protein rich and once the caterpillars hatch out and they feed on the egg shell they have enough energy to move around and depending upon you know how healthy the female was the female can take a chance about trial and error and you could expect at least you know out of 100 five or six actually do go in and uh, find the right plant and my phd specifically focuses on this because the butterfly that i am working with 
lays mm. eggs on a bat, you know, plant which is no, which it is not supposed to lay eggs on, and the caterpillars are very weak to even move out of the plant. Mm. So all of the butterfly, I mean, all of the caterpillars die, and we have seen almost like 20% decline in their population since the fa- past 40 years. Mm. So it all depends on you know the life history of the moths and life history of you know the individual itself. But yeah, trial and error can be beneficial given certain circumstances. No, but trial and error method on the flip side of the coin can also give a lot of adaptability in uh, selecting the host plants, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, for example, you know, if you have a female which is, okay, let's consider two females where one female mm-hmm. has very high specificity where she does not make any mistakes. She has a higher chance of, you know, you know, laying her eggs on the right plant so all her offsprings develop and they move on to the next generation. Whereas if you have a female who keeps doing a lot of trial and error method, she might not get, you know, she might not get a chance to, you know, pass on her genes. So over a period of time, you have, but you know, you have moths which are adapted to very specific host plants as well. So it's yeah, it's, it's I mean yeah, when you look at it as a whole picture, trial and error is bad and good depending upon the contest. And like you said, it definitely helps in adaptation over a period of time. Thank you, Nitin. Nice to hear you. <laughs> Anybody else? Hello? Anyone else wants to Hello, ask sir, questions? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Hello, sir. I am Sound Agriculture uh, University. Uh, one minute, sir. Uh, Sound Rajan, sir. One minute. Nitin, yes, yes. I just yeah. want to know the time availability because we have extended it. No problem with you. You continuing to answer. Can you yeah, tell us the time? For another half an hour or something. I go to the lab around like 11 a.m. So I still have an hour to go. So if I, I mean, I can stay around for another half an hour. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then, sir, proceed. Then I have a question. We'll, uh, take, take. Okay. Yes, sir. Please proceed, sir. Ah, yes, sir. Sir, uh, Nitin, sir, your uh, presentation was excellent, sir. Very informative. Yes. Uh, I have one basic uh, doubt, sir. Yeah. Uh, regarding co-evolution. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, you are uh, discussing about the co-evolution between uh, insects, particularly moths and uh, plants. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, in the adaptation, of, uh, if you see the insects or uh, moths, they are having very shorter life period. For example, uh, uh, around uh, one, one to one and a half months, 30 to 48 days, the life cycle will be completed. Whereas in case of plants, if it is an annual plant, it will take more than uh, three or four months. If it is a perennial crop, it is uh, more than a uh, year or uh, more than five to 10 years also perennial crops are there. So yeah. between these uh, entities, uh, these uh, two entities, the insects are adapting very faster than the plants. I think so. So can you throw some light how this phase of evolution between plants and insect, how it is coinciding? Uh, plants and insects. Yeah, so that's actually a really good question because I mean it kind of you know gets us to the question as to which came first: did plants evolve first, or did insects evolve first, or did they both evolve together? And that's a very interesting question to ask, and that's something that has been you know studied for almost since 1964. So the first hypothesis what people put out was that plants, you know, land plants evolved first. And then the insects started specializing on them. And so it, it was basically like in, insects tracking plant resources to begin with. And then once you know insta- insects started attacking plants, the plants then started having defenses. And then you know the coevolution arms race started. So you spoke about you know uh, insects having shorter generations, but plants yes, having yes, you know yes, more, yes. you know what do you call uh, longer generations. But if you you know think about it, a lot of these uh, insects, when they have let's say three months, especially in, I, mean, I mean we'll talk about tropics and you know temperate region differently because they have different mechanisms. In the tropics, you know you have uh, you know but you know moths coming out year round. I mean there are a few moths which are very specific to you know some months, probably you know, in summer or in the winter. But you have a lot of you know moths which are perennial as well. You know they die and they you know keep reproducing and reproducing. So in terms of, you know, uh, uh, what do you call, plants evolving, it's uh, mostly that, you know, uh, they have very specific set of genes. So the one is the P453, uh, the cytochrome genes, and a lot of, you know, uh, basic uh, secondary metabolite genes. And all of these secondary metabolite genes, they evolved a very long time ago. For example, let's say, let's consider uh, mustard plants. I mean, when you eat mustard, you have this very pungent, you know, you have a very particular smell. When you cook something with mustard oil, you can say that is it is mustard oil. So the mustard oil has specific compounds which evolved a long time ago. So what is happening now is basically the plant. Let's say you know yeah, you, yeah. Uh, the you know the moth lays eggs on you know this 
let's say it lays, lays, egg, lays eggs in June or July, and then it completes its life cycle by September. So what happens by then is that the plants actually start upregulating its uh, those already evolved systems, and they start you know having different combinations. Let's say if the plant has ten different combinations, if when they when it first got attacked, it only five were active, it'll start getting the sixth or seventh compound active. So that kind of you know that small tinkering can make it harder for the you know. Uh, insect to feed on and that those kind of uh, you know tinkering cap capacities can evolve very quickly even in plants because you know let's say you have a plant which reproduces every 10 years so over a period of 10 years it has very it has kind of accumulated a lot of adaption in terms of diversity of its you know what do you call uh, uh, recept i mean is chemical compounds and when you have the seeds you have seeds which have all of these chemical compounds as well so within the plant's lifetime and across plant's lifetime you know or you can kind of see both insect and uh, plant coevolution kind of matching out. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Nitin. Yeah. The, the, yeah there there are two questions from uh, the Melvin. Uh, the yeah. Melvin uh, was our rector here, and uh, father is from the botany department, is a botanist. The questions yeah. are uh, Will the absence of specific host plant cause end of the life cycle of the particular moth? One. Two, can the toxins present in this uh, colorful moths uh, he's referring to could be utilized for any useful bioproducts? These are two questions from Father Melvin. Jai Shankar, yeah. repeat once again the questions. One, will the absence of specific host plant cause end of the life cycle of that particular moth? Uh, two, can the toxins present in colorful moths could be utilized for any useful bioproducts? Yeah, uh, Father Melvin, that's actually two really interesting questions. The first one being what happens if, you know, the host plant is gone. So that again depends on the degree of specialization the moth has. So, for example, let's say you're talking about a generalist species. If, you know, five or six of its, of its host plant goes from the habitat, it can still find another plant because it kind of has the mechanisms to, you know, what do you call, uh, combine different kind of receptors and still be able to taste uh, plants and survive on it. But if you're talking about a specialized moth where it feeds on a very narrow set of plants, it is bound to go extinct unless there is a rapid adaptation to feed on some other plant. And there are instances where there has, you know, where we have seen rapid adaptations over one generation. And that is very, very specific examples. But yeah, in general, if you ask me if those if the moths are generalist, then they will not have a lot of issues with plants going extinct. But if the moths are specialists, then they will definitely have a higher probability of going extinct. And that again brings us to the whole point of you know conservation biology, where you want to conserve species which are specialized. You do not want to invest too many resources on uh, conserving generalist species because once you have these specialist species doing well, you kind of know that you are also providing habitats and plants for the specialists, you know, for the generalist species. So. It is very important for us to make sure that we kind of know what these specialized interactions are, what these specialized plant combinations are, so that we can kind of make sure that the moths and plants don't go extinct. And unfortunately, we do not know for we do not have this information for a lot of moth species in India, and that is something which I think a lot of students. I mean, I started uh, rearing butterflies and moths when I was in first year BSc. I mean. Shish Kumar sir, you know, can and Thomas sir can actually remember, you know, me bringing in moths and cats and keep collect, you know, when I used to just collect them and keep them and, you know, all all places in the, you know, zoology lab. So it's like this is something that students can actually start doing that now, so that we have more information for this and we can actually form better conservation efforts to, you know, preserve these things. And the second question where you spoke about the specialized secondary compounds which could be used for uh, medicinal purposes. I think uh, a lot of people are investigating this and we have found a lot of these compounds are, are in fact very highly medicinal in nature. For example, the tiger moths, which feed on their host plants, they accumulate cardiac glycosides. So studying these cardiac glycosides have actually shown us that, you know, these things can help in, you know, uh, you know, contracting heart, you know, uh, or helping, you know, in heart, you know, the health of the heart in a lot of human beings because cardiac glycosides can contract the heart or you know they can uh, influence how fast and you know how the heart rate is and 
uh, studying these moths have actually helped us understand how the cardiac glycosides act, and we can actually use these specific cardiac glycosides which are in the moths to you know and prepare them synthetically and use them as therapeutic uh, purposes. And there are also another set of uh, you know compounds known as iridoid glycosides. They are again very very helpful in uh, uh, using for a lot of blood disorders, and a lot of moths feed on it. And actually, by studying a few of these moths, they found out that the way the moths store these are actually in a very non-toxic form in their body. But when you break it and when you combine it with the, with your saliva, with where the predators do it, then it becomes toxic. So a lot of these compartmentalizations and you know the way the chemical structure of these uh, of the way the moths store it, we have learned a lot from it. And I think in terms of you know we have prepared those synthetically in the lab but in terms of actively using it in medicine i think we are still a bit away because of all of all the you know issues involved with human trials and things like that uh, any more questions uh, dr john paul if there are questions you can uh, put up uh, yeah there are uh, certain questions raised uh, from the youtube link yeah uh, can miss. Can I can I read it? Yeah, please. Read uh, there it. are yeah there, yeah there are a few questions raised by uh, uh, Krinmi uh, Nagbant. The mm -hmm. first one is: Are we using the ultrasonic waves created by bats for abandoning moths that are plant pests? I suppose I was clear. Yeah, yeah, I understood. Your question was: yeah. we using ultrasonic bat waves to kind of you know. Uh, control yeah, pests with yeah. of you know plants. Yes, yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. So uh, this is the, I mean I know for sure that some places in uh, Costa Rica, some places in Ecuador have actually used uh, you know these uh, ultrasound signaling emitters in their uh, fields to ward off pests. But the thing is, a lot of these pests uh, you can only control the egg laying of females when you use this. But once the eggs have been you know eggs are laid, it's very I mean, it really doesn't work because the caterpillars uh, have not, you know, they do not really have a lot of defense or you cannot deter them from feeding on the plant. So the best thing for, you know, deterring plant, uh, uh, I mean, so if you want to deter females from laying eggs, yes, you can actually use these bad echolocation uh, to uh, jam, you know, to scare these females away. But when it comes to larvae, I think it, the best way or the safest way is to introduce a lot of biocontrol pests like spiders, like ants and parasitoids, which will do the job for you. But there's also a downside of using, you know, bat echolocators uh, to um, jam these signals, I mean, to scare away moths, because then you're also, uh, you know, polluting the environment with your, you know, echolocation. And that can actually have a lot of effect on native bats. And you know, it, which will again, you know, kind of have a own cascade of its, you know, bad effects. So uh, the best, I mean, so that's the reason people have not, <coughs> excuse me, have not used bat echolocation a lot. What they have used is pheromones. So they take in the female pheromone or the male pheromone. They, you know, apply it to a surface or you know, they apply it to a container and they hang it in the field. And within a few, you know, hours, you have like hundreds and hundreds of moths just sticking onto it and you can just kill them right away or you can manage them however however you want. And in terms of managing uh, caterpillars, I would definitely say biocontrol pests is much better than using any sort of insecticides because that is kind of, you know, you're returning, you're kind of leaching the insecticides to the environment. So yeah, that is my opinion on using echolocation for pest control. Yeah, I think uh, Karen may would be satisfied. Uh, the next question asked by her, if two slug moths come closer, do they die due to their spines? Is the second question she has raised. Hmm. Uh, so if you know, if you talk about two slug moth caterpillars, if they come together, they'll die. No, they won't because uh, the way, you know, if you, if you, the way to look at this is to, you know, look at their uh, morphological structures are under SEM so that you know what kind of you know structures physical structures they have which makes up the spines and what lays underneath it so the spines have uh, you know glands which uh, produce these you know itchy substances but you know apart from these openings everything else is very well covered so even if you have 10 slug moths next to each other even if they keep touching even if they keep bashing into each other they are totally immune to it it's only us who have you know or you know any other predator which have these 
specific receptors or specific you know combinations of these uh, receptors which will create us to either run away from the predator or to you know start itching is where it affects so the moths or uh, caterpillars are totally immune in fact if you see a lot of slug moth caterpillars you can see them huddling you know in groups they are gregarious that means they form groups and they kind of you know stay together so it doesn't definitely does not affect the moth caterpillars okay the third question by her by the same person uh, if moths are nocturnal how can they see or uh, what about their uh, vision uh, use yeah so uh, for example you know uh, when i spoke about vision in moths so you see uh, i mean people have started to observe or you know they have started to discover that from the morphological aspect till the genetic aspect moths have evolved speci uh, specific structures to help them see in the night so for example if you look you know uh, insect eyes are made out of umatidia which are small eyelets you know eye, uh, you know eye, eyes which when you combine into millions of them form the insect eye so if you compare you know what we you know this is one way which again students can actually do it if they have you know once they get proper permission from you know forest department authorities or local authorities where you know you can collect moths and you can actually spread a thin layer of nail polish like you know the clear nail polish on the eyes of the moths and you can peel that off and then if you look at it under the microscope you can actually measure the size of each umatidia and what people have seen is that the nocturnal nocturnal moths have higher or larger umatidia compared to the diurnal moths so having larger you know structures is one great thing because you can have more light penetrating into it and secondly what people have seen is that the cones and rods which are the unit of eyes which help in perceiving light they are way more sensitive compared to diurnal moths so having larger you know umatidia having more sensitive cones and rods and your you know gene expression the opsin gene expression is completely different in nocturnal moths compared to diurnal moths so nocturnal mo moths have specific uh, you know uh, opsin gene expression which will express even at the sign you know slightest of uh, uh, you know uh, light so combining you know larger eye eyelet you know umatidia size very sensitive rods and cones and you know differential expression of opsin genes in nocturnal moths i think they can they can see very well and they also have ears to you know kind of avoid the bats and you know eyes to see whatever they have to see and usually even you know when moths are flying about in the night they use a lot of navigation systems you know such as uh, you know their surrounding you know habitat in terms of what colors the surrounding habitat as what contrast it is and what is the position of the sun and so not the sun the moon and the stars so that they can orient themselves and looking at you know whenever they see something white they know okay that is something that i can go on and feed or something like that so moths have very fine tuned vision equipped for the night especially nocturnal moths fine this is a question uh, by uh, bharati shanbag uh, why moths are available more during the early raining season now oh, that's uh, directly related to host plant availability you know let's say you know just before the mo you know uh, okay uh, it again depends on what kind of you know moths you are talking about and what kind of species you are talking about so there are three ways in uh, I, I mean i don't know if it's three or four but yeah there are multiple ways in which this can happen so let's consider you see a lot of moths right after the monsoon or right during the monsoon so what this means is that just a few weeks or you know months before the monsoon there must have been a lot more foliage a lot more plants so there a lot more you know a lot more eggs or caterpillars survived to huddle to it so you have a population burst happening or you could you know that's one condition which can happen right during or right before the monsoon and then you also have the spring season coming up right before the rainy season or you know spring and the, you know you have the spring the summer and the rainy so when you have a lot more younger leaves in spring season that means younger leaves usually do not have great chemical defense in them so a lot more you know moths can feed on them a lot more caterpillars can survive and then when they pupate during summer they can all emerge in huge numbers during monsoon and third thing what you can see is you have this periodical fluctuations where you have a boom of you know uh population burst and then you have you know a down of population happening that's uh, a cycle which happens in nature and you know depending upon species you can have every you can have burst every 10 years you can have every burst every few you know 3 or 4 years so it again depends on species biology 
environmental conditions and again you know plant quality as well so combining all of those three is you can actually predict when you will see bursts of population happening in your surrounding area fine there is an another interesting question doctor Bayer, doctor Angela john paul in the rich yeah, john dr john yeah. paul uh, nitin can we wind by 8 we don't want to take much of your yeah. time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, one uh, dr john paul two more yeah john sure. john one second yes sir uh nitin can you put on your video let us see you for the last few minutes at least yeah I'll, yeah it's still early in the morning so let's see if i can make myself yeah i mean i'm not sure if you can see me now but yeah stop sharing yeah yeah i can see you yeah we can see you we can see you now yeah fine see if moth no if moth they pollinate yeah. at night why do they visit our home especially at night yeah so uh, think about um, think about it this way so whatever vision that has evolved in moths happened much before the evolution you know much before the invention of the light bulb so all of your light bulbs are bright sources which the moth sensor saying that this is something that i need that is you know favorable for me in terms of either laying eggs or either uh, you know what do you call pollinating flowers or getting nectar so what has what happens what has happened ever since the invention of light bulb is that in the night it is supposed to be completely dark but it is not dark so moths are getting confused that light sources are actually sources of food or sources of mate location and things like that so that so this term there's actually a, a term for this which is known as an evolutionary trap where signals which were once very favorable like you know or uh, before the invention of the light bulb anything that was bright and nice was supposed to be very rewarding for the moth right so if you have a very big bright patch of flowers that means okay that means there are more flowers there's more nectar there so you can actually eat a lot more so signals which were once very rewarding are now causing disruptions for those organisms and this is known as an evolutionary trap because they the moths have not evolved any sort of mechanism to avoid these traps because their vision is just tuned to see if it's bright it's food so they fall into this trap and this is a you know consequence of evolution over a period of time and that's why we call it an evolutionary trap so i would you know if that's the main reason why moths come into your homes or you know they keep flying around fire and they caught and get caught in fire and die fine uh, there's an another question Uh, will the moths be able to survive below 15 degrees centigrade celsius maybe lower yeah. temperature yeah. so a lot of the temperate moths that we see you know especially in north america or you know northern europe or russia moths can actually even survive below freezing point so what happens is that they shut down their you know system you know they shut down the circulation they shut down their metabolism and they just lie down you know they just stay as you know still organ you know or, you know organisms on the snow or wherever they are and once the temperature starts uh, heating up they activate their metabolism again and they are good to go so moths again you know as adults can survive uh, over winter you know as you know by freezing themselves or they can also do one thing where you know the adults lay eggs right before the winter and then when you know the eggs kind of stay dormant for like 6 or 7 months and then they hatch when the conditions are all right or they can you know uh, feed up till you know becoming pupae and then they be can become pupae and the pupae can overwinter and then once the conditions are all right they can come in so moths can easily survive well below freezing point but again it all depends on the species of moths you're talking about if you put a tropical moth let's say in you know canada i don't think it will survive but again if you put a canadian moth in the tropics it's not going to survive so it all depends on how much of you know environmental variation the moth is used to fine now what is actually the approximate uh, life span of uh, the moths the next that again, question de that depends entirely on you know the species you're talking about some of the moths could just be you know uh, alive you know alive as adults for a day they can be alive as adults for a month or two months or you know six months you know some can be uh, uh, you know what do you call uh they can live as larvae for like one year or two years some can live as larvae for three years some can live as pupae for three years so it again depends on the kind of species you're talking about and and the kind of life stage you're talking about 
but you know you can have a huge range of variation from just a few days to almost you know a year or something fine now there is another interesting question uh, we spoke about uh, the toxic moths you know yeah you no know? yeah now how do they attain the toxicity is it by only their feeding mechanism or uh, by what other means uh, can you give a few other examples okay yeah so uh, the evolution of ap aposematism is again a very interesting concept both in ecology and zoology as well as chemical ecology because you can tackle this you know issue from a lot of uh, different angles so uh, you know if you let's talk about, you know I'm, I'm, i'll try to say this in, in 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 the form of a story so imagine a you know a species of moth has started feeding on a plant and the plant starts you know evolving defenses and the moth again you know does something you know evolve something else to counter defense so after a period of time you have this plant which is very very specialized which is producing this very nasty chemical which only this moth can feed so there are two things that the moth can do so one is a it can uh, find a way to detoxify this chemical compound you know in some you know through its met metabolism where let's say if you eat cyanide you just attach a side chain to it and then make it you know it's no longer toxic or you can just change the chemical you know structure of it and then it's gone it's no longer toxic and then you know you can happily feed on it and second what you can do is you can take that compound and store it in organs and encapsulate it in such a way that it's still very toxic but it is stored in very specific organs in your body but you know let's say if you if that thing goes away from that particular organ you will also die but you know as long as it's there in that organ you are safe and it is toxic and you, since you store that toxic anything that tries to eat you will have you know will eat that toxic toxin as well so that is how moths kind of store those chemicals where they have specific structures to store them so i mean last year uh, i was involved in a study where we published uh, this research in grasshoppers where we found out that you know there is this channel called as sodium potassium channel this is very very important in all organisms throughout life to maintain your you know electrolyte balance to maintain your electrical conduction so what happens in these grasshoppers is that they pu push out everything outside the sodium potassium pump channel and they protect the sodium potassium pump because these toxic compounds attack the sodium potassium pump and they just destroy the sodium potassium pump so by you know protecting the sodium potassium pump these grasshoppers are able to feed on these toxic plants and themselves become toxic the same thing with moths moths so they might have specific adaptations to sodium potassium pump in if they are feeding on uh, cardiac glycosides if they are feeding on iridoid glycosides they might have some other uh, sort of protection so it all depends on what kind of chemical compound you are talking about where that chemical compound has a uh, effect on the body and how do you protect that particular thing and once you have evolved these characters you can easily feed on the toxic compounds either detoxify them and leave them or store them for yourselves and become aposematic and then you know make sure that no one else eats you as well fine does that Now, answer the question? what is the reason yeah yeah what is the reason for the moths to get attracted more towards light other than uh, the other insects general in general yeah that i mean uh, like i said it's no it's like when you have very high sensitivity for you know if you have if you have evolved in you know during or uh, if you have evolved a nocturnal vision that means you are very sensitive to whatever small changes of light is so you know things which have evolved in you know in bright light in the morning they know that they have light all around so they can kind of discriminate what is better and what is bad whereas in the night you do not expect to see any light and all of a sudden you have light that means you kind of go into it that's one of the reasons why moths kind of get attracted more towards light than any other organism because they have not experienced any other form of light just because they are only seen during the night and you need to think about it in terms of you know what happened what what was what the world was like before light bulbs came and what the world was before you know humans started using fire for light or anything like that because moths have been there for 300 million years i mean that's a very very long time and all of these basic mechanisms have evolved so far back in time that they are not going to change just because humans have been here for 1000 or 10000 years i mean it might take another few million years to actually change those mechanisms and i'm not sure if humans are going to stay that longer anyway so yeah oh, fine now the moths they lay eggs no yeah they lay eggs 
either in the wall or on a cloth or on the plant sources is there yeah. any other uh, way out for the eggs dr john paul uh, sorry uh, yeah uh, what we'll do is if there are questions yeah. let them uh, post it to us and then we'll send it to nitin and nitin can yeah. uh, answer them over mail uh, because yeah, sure, it's getting sure. late uh, we will uh, uh, leave it uh, pass on to dr kavya for the vote of thanks thank you dr john paul for moderating sure, yeah, dr before, uh, sure, sure and before we thank end i mean again uh, especially for students if you want to contact me i mean i uh, i mean i am here because i got a lot of help from all the faculty that i you know that taught me in josephs and you know uh, after that as well so i am more i mean i know you have a lot of support from you know your your, your you know college and i am more than happy to help you guys you know plan studies because i know you know your professors definitely help will that help you you know go ahead with it and if you if any students are you know in, you know interested in contacting me about learning more about science or more about anything or you know i'm more than happy to do it but uh just to say that you know my specialization is in ecology and evolution so if you ask me more about developmental biology i might not know more than what shiv kumar sir taught me so yeah that is where my you know knowledge would be but if you wanted to learn more about ecology and evolution i'm more than willing to talk to you guys about it uh, dr kavya is there you are not able to hear you uh now audible kavya okay, unmute Unmute Un yourself. Fine, Nitin. Wonderful talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> Maintain your standard. Uh, yeah, your your product, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think it's getting late. I will uh, pitch in. Uh, it's moment to thank uh, Nitin. Nitin, thank you for sparing your time. Sorry for all the glitches that happened. <laughs> uh that you were here to present the talk on moth ecology and evolution uh all the questions and other queries will pass it on to you and if students are willing to get in touch we will try to reach and connect you to the students so thank you very much for being uh, the resource person for this international webinar on moth uh, diversity ecology and uh, conservation yeah. uh, thank you so also much time. thank you Uh, this is also time to thank uh, the management St. Joseph's College, uh, Reverend Father Rector and also Father Principal for their continuous encouragement and support for us to organize these uh, webinars that are benefiting students. And uh, this coincides with the National Moth Week and aptly we decided to have this. Thanks that we got two lucky resource persons. Uh, we were lucky to get them to have uh, their views presented here. i am also thankful to the department uh, of uh, zoology my hod and other colleagues in the department for their support in uh, successfully conducting this webinar uh, this uh, would not have been possible if so many participants had registered i understand due to the technical glitches there some of them had to drop but even then whoever uh, continue to stay with us uh, thank you for your uh, participation please do participate in webinars that we are uh, planning to host in the coming weeks as well last uh, but not the least this certainly would not have happened without the volunteers of the national science association uh, the pandemic has provided a situation where the previous year the 1920 batch of national science office bearers are still here and there is this next batch of volunteers also so it's being a coordinated effort of uh, every activity that they have done i should thank uh, rachel somia especially because she pitched in to shift this uh, platform from uh, google meet to microsoft teams so i'm thankful to every volunteer the list is uh, 20 plus
I hope I am able to hear you. I think the connectivity uh, touched ah, me also. Okay. Fine. Okay. So uh, that's about uh, uh, the vote of thanks. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kavya wants to pitch in. Um, we are not able to get her. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that's it. Thank you all for participating. Uh, good night. So we'll meet in some other Smart. webinar that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you to all. Thank you. Thank you to all our student coordinators for helping all the attendees. Thank you. Thank Soumya, we can uh, end the meeting and uh, stop the recording. Rachel, you're there.